long as I can. Good morning, Pete. Good morning. How are you? Great so far. As usual. Okay, this is so hard to hear. Just the speaker. All right. Welcome to our second to last appearance to one another in March, but our last club meeting in March. So if that makes you feel better. 23rd, just to remind you. We can pop over real quick to presentation. There we go. We are recording. We've been recording. Everything you were just saying is going to now be on the internet before. So I'm sorry. And it is Gonzaga. The pronunciation is Gonzaga. Just for those who have been watching ESPN and hear them say Gonzaga, which is incorrect, it is not Gonzaga, it's Gonzaga. That's what they go by the Zags, not the Zogs. Right? All right. I grew up in Washington. I got into Gonzaga, and my Catholic grandparents were very excited for me. And I told them, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go to that school. Um, all right. So, same old business for meeting agenda as usual. Nothing too different today. Um, do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and liberty and justice for all. All right, we may see one moment. We'll do the four way test of the things we think, say, and do first. Is it the truth? Is it the truth? Good will and better friendships will be beneficial to all concerned. And all right, you can see it, please. All right, Terry, if you could jump me back over to the Zoom meeting to the uh, presentation, then I'll forward us. Yeah, we can do that right before guests. Uh, there we go, right, as guests. So uh, in the room today, I see no guests, but I will point out Mike is here because we haven't seen Mike in the room for a minute. Welcome, Mike. Good to see you again. Um, <laughs> online, we have Ann, Andy, George, Pete, and uh, Suzanne Ginger, Ginger, also our speaker, Ron, who we'll get to meet in a moment. So, but no guests today. We're, we're guest free. Hey, Jay, there's a big echo. Can you do anything about that? There's, there's a, lot a lot of echo. echo? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's probably, probably two, two microphones, microphones on. on. How about that? Is that better? Oh, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, so announcements for today. Announcement number one, club social. Next week, we do not have a regular meeting. Do not show up here in the morning. None of us will be here. Uh, you'll be very lonely um, and you will not be entertained. So Twisted Pine is the selected location and destination. It's Walnut and 32nd. And that will be from 4 p.m. till, which means Probably don't show up after like seven because you won't see people there that much longer is my guess, but they won't see you, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's purely social. We have no speaker. So, and then um, the rotary minute, there's a sign up sheet up here. So we'll pass that about if you want to do another rotary minute, there are dates to do so because we've got a lot of people who've already done it this year and they don't want to do it again the 30th Wednesday. Yeah. Oh. well then you'll have to you'll have to go somewhere else on friday that let's just go twice all right. Uh, any bracket updates for March Madness? You want to give us the lowdown? Yeah, go ahead. Currently leading the pack is 
is Hinton one and Hinton two. He actually is first and second. However, however, his final picks were Purdue and Wisconsin. Oh, the Wisconsin's already gone. And Purdue, maybe. Never know. Uh, Robin Bush has actually got the highest number of points in picking Arizona. So if Arizona were to win, he's got a good shot at doing it. And the highest with uh, Gonzaga. Zaga. 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 There you go, you got it. It takes uh, is uh, Plumridge with 47 points. They're, they're out of state. Last year's, <laughs> last year's, I will say, first is now at worst. With Joanne. <laughs> she so, got lucky uh, last year. No. So I, it'll be, it'll be last good. Year. I, I, I will not be around next week. I'll be at Myrtle Beach playing golf. Oh. Uh, but oh, I will cool. send oh. out uh, either Sunday night or Monday morning the update of the sheet so you'll be able to see where you stand going into the weekend. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Uh, so the last club meeting that we mentioned, the Ukraine donations through uh, Rotary Foundation. So I'll just leave that up there. Everyone here has hopefully heard about it already. If not, you read about it in the district email. Um, and then tomorrow is a sleep out to end youth homelessness together. So just a reminder that if you have not yet already taken a look at that, um, Joe's fundraising page is sent out by email in the past, and please go and take a peek at that if you're thinking you want to be a little extra generous after seeing how it snowed a little bit yesterday and frosted again, and this is late March already, so I know it happens here, but this is a reality for people. Yeah, it's a reality for people, though, that, you know, even in late March, they're getting frost, and it's 23 degrees in the so. All right. If you go to that website, you'll see that Joe was ranked number 14 in oh. fundraising. Oh, now, yeah. Did you move up in the brackets? No, I dropped. I mean, what? Oh. So get on there and yeah. get, um, support Joe. Yeah. Let's, oh, go, give, number let's go give let's go your donation. Let's get Joe in the top 10. Let's <laughs> in the top 10. Um, so we do have happy bucks today. And since everyone here should be pretty familiar with it, we'll start on this end to do happy bucks. But I will start with Kim's virtual happy buck oh. um, from Pennsylvania. She wanted to let us know that Heather delivered a healthy boy on Sunday, 7 pounds, 15 ounces. Oh. Um, she also wanted us to know it was a difficult delivery. And they have an appointment today, which is why she can't make the call. Um, the baby's name is Ravi Ridge Singh Betty. And he's got a full head of hair already. Um, and so hopefully they'll be able to attend and maybe with Ravi next week. There you are. There's a 20, a $1 for every being at this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy because I didn't see the sunrise. I missed it for because I was in line for coffee, whatever. But I'm so happy that we live close to a our own backyard fourteener. Longs Peak looked gorgeous this morning. Uh, yeah. I'll never do it, but I can look at it. It's really pretty. I got a, I got a happy five. Um, Last Thursday morning when it started the blizzard, we drove out of state. We drove all the way to Las Vegas. We flew rockets on Friday and Saturday. We got blown out on Sunday and drove back on Monday. Oh. But I, I got to drag race my one of my business partners and beat him for the third time. So, <laughs> um, beat him by 318 feet. And I was first up. It was, it was a lot of fun. Good time. <laughs> Good time, man. man. What were you yeah. doing? Um, we didn't go in Vanna. We went in um, his forerunner towed the trailer. Uh, that's Van okay. Probably not going to be much. Van <laughs> might not make it to Vegas and back. It's got to make it to New Mexico. Did you see? Though. Did you see the snow up in the hills there? I heard they got eight oh, feet two weeks ago yeah, out of no, Vegas. We, we drove through quite a bit, but on, on the way out, by the time you hit the east side of Vale, it had pretty much stopped snowing. 
Um, oh, I mean in Vegas, the mountains. Oh the yeah, Red Rocks, oh, they, got, they got eight feet two weeks ago in like and one day. On the on the way back, we had a, a stiff tailwind and a good crosswind. But you can see the snow when Cedar City was getting dumped on. It was, it was well, there was some good weather. That's good. We need the water. Colorado's at 100% snowpack. So I've never heard of that. Wow. Hey, Joe. Yes. Where around Vegas do you shoot rockets? Um, it's actually on the Gene, Gene Roach dry lake bed. So it's um, further west or east of the California border. So there's the prim on the border, and then there's the little town of Gene where there's a a post office and a jail and a plastics factory <laughs> a bar at a closed hotel. Um, Got to be a bar. No, there's a, there's a Chevron station with like 96 pumps, <laughs> but uh, there's not much. But, but up the road is Good Springs at the Pioneer Inn. That's a great place for a ghost burger and a cold beer and a billiard table outside. And, it's, I've spent a lot of time working in Cold Springs. Yeah, it's a, that's a cool town. And they, and they do ghost tours. and um, yeah, it was They're really cool. close to the Clown Motel. That's in like, that's in, oh, oh, I can't remember the name of that town. There's a Clown Motel. It's haunted by clowns. And people, I think, just dress up as clowns there and then go and like spook you from your windows. It's like legitimately frightening. <laughs> <laughs> Nevada, it's a special place. Yeah, it must be. Yeah. Well, it, there's, there's, I mean, it's, it, it's always a good time. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, we fly rockets, we sell product, we, we lose money. The casino loves to see us walk in. You no know, penny machine still ruthless, but that's like that was the next thing. They're still ruthless. Bob Brothers, what you got? I'm glad to be sort of settled. Yeah. Bow for the lodge. Ah. Uh, it is a change of life. Absolutely. New pace. More social. Has the food improved? Bob, has the food improved? <laughs> Got one. Oh. Got a happy dollar that the old dog could fly this weekend. Oh, oh, um, the family went to Taos to ski and they had an epic ski week, but um, the old, old dog stopped eating and so I stayed home with him and this morning he's back to normal. So I think he just got into the puppy's chew toy and it set him back, but uh, it's good. <laughs> um, so I'm ha really happy because my hairdresser's finally back after three months and I get to get my hair cut this morning. Whoa! It's a mop. But anyway, and, and then I learned Saturday morning that both pastors at First and Longmont got COVID. They were exposed to a certain person. And so I ended up leading and preaching at all three services. Oh, <laughs> well, it, it was good. It just caused a little anxiety at the first. But yeah. how about you all online? Any happy bucks? Happy moments? Nope. Nobody's happy. Nobody. No, Anne, you're unmuted, but that's okay. I'm not supposed to. My, I show that I'm not muted. Yeah. But I, I just was going to say um, that I'm happy that Heather had that baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was thrilled to hear about that. Yeah. Great. Well, real quick before we move on, um, I wanted to invite Rusty up real quick. I know you're on the spot. Before. Well, we have to reprimand you. <laughs> we found we found a leak in your banking account, <laughs> and you now have like a Paul Harris plus four. So congratulations. That's almost enough to make a real sapphire. Um, and there's a the paperwork to go with it. But uh, yeah, congratulations. Well, thank you. And obviously, thank you for your contributions you. to the Rotary Foundation. And again, I want to say how easy this is. <laughs> Mary Beth takes money out of my account. Actually, it goes into the, my dues. And it just 
I get called up here about once every five years. <laughs> I can just see Maribeth literally walking over to Rusty's bank, taking money out of his account, walking back. Well, with that, I'm glad that people are giving to the foundation. Um, as you know, I work a lot for the, found, the Rotary Foundation. And right now, it's been pretty wild with what's going on in Eastern Europe. And yeah. there's, there's a lot of three projects I was working on in Ukraine were all stopped. So Georgia? Georgia's still going. I have a call with them tomorrow. And I'm pretty sure that um, we're going to look at in the board at possibly using some of the happy bucks toward that this year, just a little bit, because the district in our district is kind of weird. If you want to get this DDF that we give through the Rotary Foundation, you have to give cash to match it in inside the district in order to, to use that, to leverage it. Whereas other districts, you don't. Once you have earned it, you can ask to use it. But here we have to then give cash in addition to that from our club in order to be able to ask for it. But that's not how every district does it. So we, we've been giving a lot of our grant money away this year, but we have all that DDF that we never leveraged. We, didn't, we haven't done a matching grant in three years, yeah. four years maybe. And I know when Herb did one, we had a matching grant. When I was president, we had a matching grant for many things. And yeah. I think that then we can make so much more money. Right. So there are certainly organizations within our community that need the money. Yeah. And we definitely. have the money. We just need to have a grant. So if any of you know anyone in a not for profit, they just have to make a whatever you ask. Right. And, and with the DDF, I mean, the district's asking that the club come, come up with the equal one to one match for cash. Well, we have a grants committee that does that with the foundation's work. So I think that's just something to be think mindful of is that we, we've been submitting a lot of great grant applications, but we're missing out on all this DDF that we have sitting there. You know, there's over $100,000 unaccounted for already, and there's only three months left in the rotary year. So we kind of, well, but it, the DDF does, but it's, it's just money that no one has been asking to utilize. And, but we, we have, we have use for it. Well, I think that what maybe we should be thinking about is, and this is something we'll work with, you know, as we transition to the next year is maybe on that grant application format that we have, there's a checkbox, you know, do you want to ask for, you know, do you want this to be applied towards DDF? It would mean it would be a longer process to get the money, but you could double the amount that our club would contribute. So like if you're asking us for $4,000, but our club would only have to give two and the district could give two. We could we could make that into part of the process. Now maybe they wouldn't get it all. Yeah. Really? Okay. That's that's fast. Yeah. The biggest issue for our club is having a champion. Yeah. Somebody needs to say, okay, I'll do the paperwork. Right. And frankly, the paperwork hasn't been appreciated. Yeah. I mean, you've done it. I've done it. We've done it. So, so in the situation you brought up, Herb, um, you brought up Georgia, and this is a project where kind of 
coincidentally, um, you're familiar with in 2010, South Assyria, um, there was the revolt from some locals, plus you had a lot of influx of, you know, Russian military, at least resources of nothing else. And there was kind of like this coup as if there was going to be a secession in the region of South Assyria in Georgia. And it did not happen. Um, it ended up ending and that part of the country remains part of Georgia. And there's a lot of uh, turmoil in that country because of it. Because there are people that live there that do not want to be in Georgia anymore. And it, it's kind of like a divided country feeling. So this project is a peace project, which is a rare one, because Rotary Foundation, we talk a lot about peace, but when you look at the amount of money we spend on peace projects, it's like not even 1%, I think. It's like very small. So this project's peace, and they're doing um, like confrontation mitigation training for couples who are mixed couples of South Ossidians and you know, like Calypsi Georgians. So those couples, when they're confronted in the streets as being like cross, as being mixed and like how unconventional and horrible that is to them, they know how to you know, dissipate those confrontations and then educate people on like, you know, no, this is, we're, we're happy. We're not causing anyone harm kind of thing. So it's a very, I mean, it, to us, I think that it may not sound like such a big deal, but I'm sure a lot of people here remember when things like that still happen in the streets in the US. So the money, well, less, less common now, I think, than it used to be. But it's, yeah, but this is a big problem in Georgia right now. And so this project's really awesome, but they, they just need a little bit of money towards the global grant. It's already been established. Um, it's working with a Rotaract club there. So we just have to match a Rotaract club here. But I think with DDF, we could give as little as $500 get the district DDF approval is $1,000. And then that would be more than what they need in order to qualify to do this program. Because then that money that they're putting up, plus this money would then be matched by the Rotary Foundation and USAID. It's a triple match. So two to one. So that I think that's a powerful part of it. Um, and then the USAID program would pay for one club member to go to Georgia in order to meet the the Rotaractors and Rotarians there and then get to meet the people, you know, just doing this program. So it's a really neat opportunity. It's not a lot of contribution, but. Have you filled out a grant application for this? No, we're still talking about it because we don't have, we don't have a lot of money left that's unallocated in the grants committee. But the grants committee can also make a decision right. to spend more money. Right, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that that's kind of the idea. We're just kind of getting what we would also need is someone who would be a champion that could go and they're already sending me. I can't be that person. So we would need someone who's willing to travel to Georgia for four or five days at some point in the next year. So that's what we're really looking for. Yeah, see, everyone got quiet there. <laughs> Not in, no, Georgia, Georgia's pretty, it's pretty relaxed at the moment. I mean, if, if they end up joining NATO, then maybe it would be a little different, but they wouldn't send you there if that happened. It's just like my trip next month to, or to, in May to go to Serbia got canceled. So I'll probably go in the fall. But yeah. Think about it. If you want to travel out there, that's, Yeah, definitely. And they're doing a lot. They're going to do a wine swap. So like quarterly, you would have a call in with the Georgian Rotarians and they're going to, they make their own wine so we can get some of their wine and send them stuff. And then we'll have like little social calls. <laughs> well, it's... All right. Well, with that, we'll move forward. We've got, um, presentation coming up here so if we could swap ron over to co-host terry that'd be super helpful you can do it in the list as well if, if you can't see it there um oh okay awesome so looks like we've made ron co-host but today ron um was brought to us 
Uh, I saw that he's also spoke at some other, at least one other Rotary Club in the district, but he'll be talking to us about rural and urban United States. And just, I could not find any mention of Ron on the internet, except for that one thing. So I pulled up some photos of maps uh, of rural versus urban designations from the US census. Um, and there's one from the 70s, so this is a bit older, but then the more modern style where we look by county and you can see non-core all the way up to large metro areas. And there's a few other maps I have later. So if Ron's looking for maps, we can grab those. But I think I see Ron has now jumped to uh, provide us the, um, his presentation. So we'll uh, let him take the reins here. Ron, I think we should be able to hear you. So let's okay. do a sound check real quick. So how do we get his- I'll take care of it. I'll have to move it physically. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks, Ron. We can hear you. Okay, fantastic. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me today. Uh, this is the fourth Rotary I've now talked to in the last year and a half. And it's interesting seeing the different personalities of the different uh, Rotary chapters. And you guys certainly rate high in terms of uh, congeniality and uh, a nice atmosphere. So with that, thank you very much for the invite. Uh, I'm uh, a native of Cincinnati, Ohio. Went to the University of Cincinnati, got a degree in aerospace engineering. And Neil Armstrong is one of my professors. Uh, mm -hmm. I then worked in the uh, uranium enrichment industry for about a decade in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, and came out of here uh, in 1985. I'm married, I have uh, three grown children, all married, and I have four grandchildren. I'm uh, an active member of the Colorado Mountain Club. In fact, with a couple of friends, uh, I'll be uh, probably up on Lookout Mountain uh, doing a little hiking up there tomorrow morning. And I'm, I'm hiking just about every week. I'm a very avid uh, silver sneakers person, uh, happily married and uh, retired. I'm age 70. And, uh, I uh, speak all, at least every third, fourth week to a class at a big Methodist church in Highlands Ranch, a class we call Contemporary Issues. And I'm real pleased that in that environment, uh, I'm given total freedom. We're not boxed into uh, closed mind thinking, uh, and the group welcomes uh, open minded thinking. So I have presentations on a huge variety of subjects. And, uh, with that, I'll get started. Uh, this particular topic is one I like the urban rural clash. Uh, my mom uh, grew up on a farm, and uh, I have a huge number of relatives back in Cincinnati out in a rural area. And it was always interesting growing up as a kid, seeing the little different uh, perspectives you take. Uh, I was a, a city mouse. My cousins were mostly country mice. And seeing some of the different outlooks and perspectives on society we got from my growing up in a Cincinnati suburb versus so many of my cousins being out in a more rural area. But let's get started. Uh, we're going to look at a couple books uh, that are really valuable to look at this uh, urban rural divide. Uh, one by Bob Wuthrow, Wuthnow, uh, The Left Behind, that book you see on the screen. And one of the more in depth ones uh, done by Catherine Kramer up here in Wisconsin about five years ago. Uh, she actually spent about three or four months out in the field of rural Wisconsin talking to people in cafes and diners, just trying to get a feel for why is there this increasing urban rural divide? And it's a polarization that's happening more and more. Uh, this polarization was uh, probably brought to life, light in the literary uh, books by the book uh, that's now a good decade old called The Big Sort uh, by Bill Bishop. And, uh, Bill in his book said, Americans have sorted themselves into alarmingly homogenous communities. And in this book, he, uh, he goes through, there's a lot of charts and data, and some of it's a little bit out of date, but the same trend has continued. And if anything, the sorting and the divide has gotten a little worse. 
I want to apologize to uh, anybody that's got a rural background. I'm not trying to attack uh, the rural side. Obviously, I grew up in a suburb and have been a city slicker for a long time. But uh, it, we need to look at both sides and try to understand both sides uh, a little better. The Kaiser Family Foundation uh, did an intensive study that they put online uh, uh, several years ago, but it's got some really good in depth insights into this rural uh, parting from the uh, urban thought. There's another great book called Dying of Whiteness by Jonathan Metzl. And it's subtitled, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing American's Heartland. Uh, then uh, relative to the uh, Black Lives Matter issues and stuff, another book that's uh, well worth reading is the book Sundown Towns. Uh, and it basically uh, looks at uh, how there was tremendous strife in uh, America in the early 1900s relative to uh, not only the horrific lynching, but so many small towns and rural areas expelling and making uh, the black community totally unwelcome. Uh, there were signs, in fact, I talked to a friend just yesterday grew up in rural Oklahoma and he said, Ron, uh, yeah, there was one of those signs uh, when I was a kid outside my little uh, Oklahoma town. And uh, the signs often said uh, the N word, don't let the sun go down on you. Uh, this particular slide talks about the two towns, uh, Anna and Jonesboro in Southern Illinois. After they had in, in 1909, a spectacle lynching, uh, both towns expelled their African-Americans and both towns have been uh, all white ever since. Most people don't realize how much that sundown town uh, effect took hold. And even in Colorado, uh, Louisville, Golden, parts of Colorado Springs uh, had quite a bit of uh, Ku Klux Klan activity and were considered <laughs> sundown towns. Uh, Loveland had a large sign up there that said, welcome to Loveland, sweetheart town. But then there was a smaller sign beneath it uh, that said, we observe Jim Crow laws here. So we in Colorado have not been immune to uh, some of that strife. All right, a little bit of politics. Uh, this is how the counties split in the 2020 presidential election. More red means more GOP. More blue means more uh, uh, Democrat. And uh, you look at that map of the United States, and the first thing you say is, gee, are there any Democrats left? Uh, and there's uh, also on this map, it shows how the counties went in Colorado in terms of their political polarization, which by the way, we'll see lines up heavily with the rural urban split. Urban and suburban areas, we'll look at some data, very strongly moving more democratic and rural counties becoming heavily more uh, Republican. And this is how the counties in Colorado went in the, uh, latest presidential election. You can see the urban areas, the more suburban areas uh, definitely went democratic and uh, the counties, the rural counties in particular, heavily the other direction. If you look at a uh, population concentration map, you see why, uh, uh, why you can lose so many counties in, a, in an election but if you concentrate on the peaks, as I call it, where the population is count, concentrated, uh, you can win the election by working on the peaks. And essentially you do have to work on the peaks uh, if you wanna to get to the, the heart of the country. More and more America is uh, urban and suburban and rural areas are in general losing population. I don't wanna overstress the uh, uh, political part of it, this is a, a change in presidential vote by uh, county type. And there was an article just this last week in the Washington Post, what the political shift in rural counties looks like since 2000. But uh, basically, uh, if a county is, or an area is staying even, you wanna be on that middle line. You can see where the large suburbs 
are starting to drift a little more towards the Democratic side. But you can see the tremendous rise and the shift in the political climate uh, in the rural community. It's dramatically shifting uh, to the Republican side. And of course, the large urban area going the other direction. All righty. Uh, I work at a nuclear facility in a uh, very small Ohio County for about three years after I graduated. I was test loop engineer at a gas institution plant. And uh, it was in Pike County, Ohio. Pike County was, of course, uh, intimately brought to the attention of the country by the uh, Pike County Massacre. I don't know if anybody in the audience heard of that. That's, that's where uh, eight uh, members of the Roden family were uh, killed at at least three different locations in one night there in Pike County. But uh, interestingly enough, Pike, uh, Piketon and Waverly were sundown towns. Uh, but have, living there for about three years with my wife, and uh, of course our first son was born while we lived there. Uh, Pike County only had, this, this is in Ohio, uh, it's about an hour south of Columbus, had only about a 2% black and Hispanic demographic in total. So you could go through most of the day there, certainly in town, and never see a person of color. And for that matter, there were very, very few people of Hispanic, or even Oriental background. Uh, Pike County, again, looking at the bar chart, uh, over 95% white. Ohio, in general, is only 73% white. And the nation right now is about 61% white. So again, that's, a, that's certainly one of the differences we see between urban and uh, rural America. Prosperity in Colorado. Uh, this blue red chart has nothing to do with politics. Here they've uh, shown uh, Colorado in terms of prosperity or lack thereof of the counties. And the darker the blue, the more prosperous and economically healthy the counties are. And you can see where the front range is really where the action is. And we can see that uh, there are huge swaths, particularly of Southeast Colorado, that are even losing population and their economic uh, strength is incredibly low. So there is a migration out of uh, Southeast uh, Colorado and the San Luis Valley. And that migration has been going on for 40 or 50 years. Okay, looking uh, nationwide at jobs, uh, this shows the change in jobs by uh, county and rural area type uh, between 2000 and 2019. And we can see where the, uh, the major metro and the major metro suburbs uh, on the left are by far the strongest in terms of economic growth. And unfortunately for rural America, way over there on the right of the chart, we see the, uh, the rural economic activity. And it is at best stayed even and in many, many counties, uh, the economic strength has even dropped. Uh, the bar there, six out of 10 rural counties lost jobs in the last two decades. So the growth in America is not homogenous. It's very divided. And that's one of the things that's making the uh, rural urban divide uh, more dramatic. This is a projection of where the population change in Colorado will occur in the next uh, 20 or 30 years. And it's it, it lines up with the map of uh, economic strength uh, almost exactly. You can see where if you want to be where the economic action is, you want to be along the front range, or at least maybe out there in Garfield or Mesa County, if the oil and gas industry can strengthen a bit there. Okay, so how do the rural and urban areas uh, disagree? Well, they disagree on who wins and loses in the new economy, who deserves the most help in society, and whether the federal government shows preferential treatment to certain types of people. Uh, we also have to look at perceptions. Often rural America and urban America have perceptions. Sometimes those perceptions line up with facts, sometimes they don't. But uh, 
we all we look for what we call relative deprivation and the concerns are rooted rooted in economics community self-respect and a strong anxiety about position relative to others right now in america we're having a big problem with particularly young white males particularly those that uh, have not gone the collegiate route and they're really feeling the stress uh, they're feeling like they're losing their status in society and uh, they they often feel that the government's giving priority to the black community or to immigrants or to city dwellers and uh, leaving them out interestingly enough though in Catherine Kramer's book again this is the lady went out and that went out into the rural Wisconsin community and wrote the book, The Politics of Resentment. Uh, she said, this is what I saw and heard. She said, a belief that the rural areas are ignored by the decision makers. Uh, just an aside on Colorado, Colorado has 26 counties with under 10,000 residents. So we have some very rural counties. And if you go talk to the people there, they do feel quite a bit left out and left behind. Uh, there is the perception that the rural areas do not get their fair share of resources. And of course, uh, the rural folks often have a fundamentally distinct set of values and a lifestyle, which is often misunderstood by a city folks. Looking at some data though, from Catherine Kramer's book, uh, she plotted data, uh, this graph, hard to read, but the x-axis is the percentage rural of the county. And she plotted in Wisconsin, the federal dollars spent per capita, according to a county's uh, rural concentration. And she found that the rural areas were actually getting more federal money spent than them than the more urban areas, contrary to what many of the rural people believe. So they're not getting uh, short-sighted short in Wisconsin uh, relative to how much aid goes into the rural areas. And this is the percentage return in state aid ratio to taxes paid. So relative to taxes paid, she found in Wisconsin, the more rural areas were getting more state dollars per dollar paid in taxes. And sometimes rural people forget this. They forget that to put a road out into a, uh, I call it a, a Yellowstone TV show farm, takes a lot more money and investment than uh, it does to put a, uh, a sewer, a, a electric line or something to a, an urban area. But they actually, uh, need to remember that they're actually getting more benefit per dollar than the uh, urban areas. Okay. Is there a core issue behind all this? Well, many have said that uh, there's a struggle going on, not only in our country and our state, but in the world right now, uh, particularly in the Western uh, countries. When I say the Western countries, Europe, uh, the United States, Australia. Are we going to be a multicultural society that welcomes newcomers and embraces its growing diversity? Or are we going to become a more provincial <laughs> that tries to go back to the past, an earlier era of traditional gender roles and white Christian dominance? Uh, a great movie that's uh, for any of you that are teachers in high school, they have kids watch and write a paper on would be the movie Pleasantville. I don't know how many saw this. Uh, Toby McGuire and uh, some others were in it. But it has quite a bit of, uh, shall we say, moral message in it. And certainly looks into uh, sticking with a stagnant society or a more progressive society that's moving to the future. We're also in America seeing... Uh, this slide I call sell your baby carriage stock. If we plot the fertility rate of US uh, women, we can see that the, and you need, by the way, 2.2, that line I've got drawn across there, to keep the population of your country constant 
uh, in the future. Uh, and this is without immigration. But clearly you can see, probably with the advent of the birth control pill uh, in the very late 60s and starting about 90, 1970, the fertility rate of the country dropped below that 2.2 line. That means uh, if America is to hold its population steady, it must have some immigration. Interesting piece of data there, but a very true piece of data. All righty. Uh, some Colorado specifics relative to this uh, urban rural divide. Uh, within Colorado, there was even talk in some of the northern counties of seceding from Colorado and joining Wyoming. And in Colorado, there's pretty strong rural, urban, suburban clash relative to resource extraction, uh, how to handle the coal, oil, and gas industry, how much restriction, how much uh, property, how much drilling to allow, how much fracking near uh, more populated areas. Uh, if you've ever sat in the hills in the morning and watched the yellow cloud coming up over the Commerce City refinery, that's an area we have to deal with. Uh, the gun violence in the urban areas is uh, quite bad. There's no denying that. But the rural folks don't see it in, in the same light whatsoever. They are, I won't say immune, but uh, parted from the uh, real realization of what happens in the uh, uh, urban areas. And so that's another area of clash between rural and urban America. The competition for water, it's only going to get more intense. Uh, you've probably read the articles about uh, the plans to take some of the uh, San Luis Valley water and pump it to Jefferson County. Uh, and many rural areas, they don't try to do it, but sometimes they almost have an implied virtual sundown town atmosphere. Uh, again, rural America is making great strides in this area, but it's still there. And uh, there was another book out that looks at even the religious perspective of uh, the urban rural divide. And it's uh, called uh, Jesus and John Wayne. And uh, politically, socially, culturally, the rural counties take on more of a uh, conservative Christian white view. Uh, the urban counties have a more progressive and changing atmosphere. And that too has caused uh, quite a bit of contention. Okay, rural Rust Belt resentment. Uh, most counties respond to rising inequality with greater uh, redistribution, but not the US. Uh, they have found one problem we have in America with giving more welfare and more social benefits particularly to others, is the fact that many whites see that as uh, helping people of another race, and they have trouble with that. Uh, a lot of other countries have, have an easier time with more liberal social programs because the people don't feel like they're giving the money to another race. But we have the problem in our country because a lot of people think, now I'm a white guy, I only want to give money to white guys. I don't want to give to uh, somebody that's of uh, a different nationality or racial heritage. And we do find that the working class voters in a lot of the old industrial towns often do cling to guns, religion, anti-immigrant, anti-trade, and anger at people not like them. All righty. Uh, a couple quotes from the book, Dying of Whiteness. I used to live, I lived in Tennessee for eight years in Oak Ridge. Oak Ridge was an incredibly odd, progressive county relative to the rest, much of the rest of Tennessee. Uh, so many of us in Oak Ridge, Tennessee had come from other areas that so we didn't capture the rural Tennessee uh, values as well as some of the other towns. But one fellow in Tennessee in this book said, I'd rather die than embrace a law that gives minorities or immigrants more access to health care. 
even if it helps me as well. So again, there's that uh, uh, difficulty embracing people of other races and other uh, nationalities. All righty. And then there's the people that say, I hate the federal government, but I sure like my Social Security and Medicare, my senior tax citizen tax break, my farm commodity price supports, federal grants to rural hospitals, my disaster relief. Uh, and I, of course, love that song by Paul Simon. All lies and jest, a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. From that famous song, The Boxer. <laughs> okay, some of the rural and small town fears. Uh, a lot of the rural and small town people fear that people are leaving the community. Uh, I know when I lived in that small Ohio county, uh, if you went south to Portsmouth, Ohio, along the river, it was a small town that tended to be depopulating and dying. And one guy said around here, when a person graduates from high school, they have to either move out or join the military services or do something else. Uh, the cities and suburbs are attracting the immigrants. The immigrants are not going into places like Pike County, Ohio. Uh, the rural areas are having significantly higher teenage pregnancy rates and out of birth wedlocks. Uh, uh, the health and health facilities aren't, aren't as good there. And despite the vastness of some of the rural communities, they don't have the economic impact and power that the cities and the suburbs do. So that's some of their fears. Some of the dec rural decline causes, uh, changing agricultural practices, difficulties affording high price equipment with small acreage, it's cheaper to order farm supplies online than purchase them from the local feed store. Uh, small manufacturing parts firms are closing down. Uh, there's a distance from airports. Uh, it's very difficult to get high tech employees to move into the rural areas. Uh, and the rural communities uh, do better if there's other reasons to be there, such as lakes, rivers, and uh, recreational opportunities. Uh, there's again, a population of brain drain. In 1980, there were 9,000 incorporated towns with fewer than 1,000 residents. By 2010, 62% were smaller. And this is happening today. It's happening today in Colorado, particularly down in the really small town rural areas. Uh, in all 15, million people were living in rural communities with declining populations. So it's, it's happening in America today. We do have a Rust Belt problem and a rural problem. There's also unfortunately a drug scourge that's occurring in uh, many of the rural areas. This is data from Ohio. Uh, and I recently did a presentation on a book called, uh, not the opioid crisis, but uh, uh, Canary in a Coal Mine about a doctor in rural Indiana who was uh, ex seeing the tremendous problem with drugs and fentanyl uh, having a terrible impact in the rural and small town communities in uh, Indiana and Ohio. Okay, let's finish with some solutions of volunteering. We need more people in all areas of the country to volunteer and to take part in uh, community and civic organizations, everything from uh, coaching a uh, Mount Hole baseball team to participating in Rotary or a local church. Uh, there needs to be more done on uh, helping the needy. Uh, there's far more uh, rural folks that are disabled, older, poor. Other remedies, uh, Training and specialized manufacturing. Uh, we need to do a lot more of that. Uh, Fiona Hill uh, put out a book about six months ago and it's well worth reading. But uh, in her book, she, Fiona Hill, of course, uh, was one of the people who testified at the first impeachment of uh, Donald Trump. But she was from British uh, background and she gave in her book uh, a 
a good um, dissertation on what she saw as the problem with lack of opportunity in rural areas uh, throughout the world, particularly Great Britain and the United States. She felt like, uh, and, and society feels like, we need more training in health and ed healthcare and education services. More people in rural areas are, are needed for to be nurses, healthcare age, aides and teachers. Uh, and then we have to kind of combat the attitude of a lot of particularly young men and middle-aged men in their 40s and 50s that are repulsed by doing service jobs. More rural American men have to get uh, acclimated to doing service jobs. And then unfortunately, there's gotta be some relocation. Uh, many Rust Belt towns and manufacturing hubs just can't be saved. Likewise, many aquifer depleted dust bowl zones uh, are in trouble and people are gonna have to get out of get out of some of those small towns. Okay, hopefully I've, uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully I haven't angered too many. So uh, at least I'm on Zoom, so you can't throw vegetables at me. <laughs> As I joke sometimes, uh, hopefully this talk has had something to offend everybody. No, I hope not. But uh, let's have some uh, questions and answers and perspectives from uh, you folks there in Boulder. <laughs> well, Ron, first, I just want to say thank you, because I know that it's also really hard to get in front of a group and talk about these things, because there is polarization, and people have, like you mentioned, beliefs, and again, you know, facts and statistics can all be their own thing, so we all know that at this point. So, Dennis, we have a question in the room here. Well, I just had a comment. I grew up in Southwest Kansas. I mean... I thought about what he has presented here today in terms of the rural versus the urban. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned with what I grew up with, you're right on. Uh, I enjoy going back to class reunions. I am kind of concerned about the next one uh, that will come up because it's pretty much uh, politically Trump. My dad was a group was with a group of people. God, I get embarrassed to say this. <laughs> that Southwest Kansas, the Panhandle of Oklahoma, Southeast Colorado, and uh, uh, North uh, uh, Southwest Colorado and uh, and New Mexico wanted to succeed from the United States. My dad. <laughs> Designed the flag. <laughs> I look back on the people that I grew up with who are still there and I keep in contact with, and I can't believe, and with the crash reunions, how myself and, and that area have just gone not quite 180 degrees, but pretty damn close to it. And some people I talked with not very long ago, whom I held in high esteem, I couldn't believe it. They don't have the sundown rule on a sign, but it is there. Mm -hmm. And this, I, I really appreciated you putting all this together for me. I mean, it's dead on as to how, what I grew up with and what it is today. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's amazing. But it is a, still a very economically viable area of the town. And they do forget about crop subsidies and a few other things that come in there from the government. But it is a very prosperous area, as opposed to Hugo and Holly and Trinidad, and, or not Trinidad, but uh, a couple of other towns in southwest Kansas, which they have one places boarded up. So in that respect, it's not quite following on this, but whoo, everything else. Yes. Thank Mary Beth has a question or a point. A comment. Uh, my cousins <laughs> live in northwest, northern Wisconsin. So the divide is very, I, can, I grew up in Milwaukee, which is very urban. And um, I jokingly called them white trash, but, <laughs> but the resentment that they feel, even though they're making money because he's now a realtor or something, and his resentment towards the people that have the money to buy vacation homes, whatever, is pretty appalling, even though 
that's how he's making his money. And so I think that there really is a divide. Yeah. Real quick, Ron, I'll point out. So as a, a employee of the federal government, this is Jay, the president here. Um, I worked for many years in NGO and then also in programs for the federal government. And you had pointed something out about how much we give to rural America. And I think that that's something that most people do not have a good concept of. Programmatic work in the US government, and, and you look at salaries like mine, that money is designated towards rural work. And that's not even something that they count when they talk about money going like distributed to the rural US. And I, I really think that that's something that needs to be better communicated that we're taking money from urban centers and redistributing it to people who live in places that are low population density. Uh, a good example of that that everyone here knows about is the Farm Service. The Department of Ag is like the biggest component of this. They, they give tons of money out with subsidies, but also the Farm Service, every county has an office, right? And those offices employ people to work there to help people in that county. And then on top of that, you also have Department of Interior and every county has RICRA. And they're out there like doing um, like work with the farms to help them recover land. You know, you're just talking about tons of money injected to those communities of people that are paying to live there in rural communities throughout the country. And then BLM, we see that mostly here in Colorado. But when I first started applying jobs out here, the first one that I got moved on was in Kremlin to go run the Kremlin BLM office. And if you've been out there, you know, like, it's rural, right? You know? <laughs> that's what we're, that's where our money's going here. We're spending it in rural America. And then one quick clarification in your slide 21, you mentioned how there's a perception that a lot of um, like assistance money is going to people who are, you know, not white identifying. But I do think that just, um, I, you kind of touched on this, but I think just to make it clear, in Department of Ag for food stamps and other services like that, the number one demographic by not just proportion, it's disproportionately this way based on the population that's receiving food stamps and other services like that in the US are white identified. So it, the lowest, the lowest poverty limits in our society, people that identify in the lowest level of economic um, achievement and in assets held are white. So I think that that's something that's really, it's generally not talked about, but like you talk about like the lowest 10% in our country, it's almost all white people. So that's another interesting part to touch on because I, I worked in tribal affairs for a very long time. So that's something that you see like they're usually thought of to be the, the lowest. But really, there's a, a margin below there's that. Even lower. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. Any other questions in the room or online? Thank you. No, thank you so much, Ron. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, Ron, we have a recording of this that we'll send the link out to you soon. Does anybody have a large Marco van parked in the parking lot? <laughs> that they're trying to cut that part of the parking lot away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joe's van is pinned out. Thank you. All right, Ron, thanks again. And uh, if you have a chance to come up and visit us, we've got a little um, a paperweight for you from Rotary for your contribution to our club here. So thank you again. Thank you. And uh, with that, I know we're just over time. So. Wednesday, it's Rotary. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh. Oh. Thank you so much.